Hey gang, it's KR King of D&D Homebrew. As you can tell, uh, my voice is nearly gone. I've had a terrible cold. Uh, and I was, I'm determined to do my videos, you know, my viewers come to expect my videos, I suppose. But also because today's topic is very near and dear to my heart. It's kind of the whole purpose of this channel, which is getting people to homebrew a sandbox RPG campaign. And this came up recently. I was playing online with a group, one of the players, I'm just playing in this group, and one of the players told me he'd really like to do a homebrewed campaign of his own creation, but the problem is he's not a writer, he doesn't have that ability, he feels like, to create this elaborate world, and he doesn't have the rules, he doesn't have all the rules memorized, he doesn't understand game design and all the things, and I'm asking him, you know, what do you, where did you get this from? And he said, well, I play Adventure Paths and, you know, campaign modules, and those are super elaborate, have tons of detail. And my answer to that was, in fact, those modules, those adventure paths, are the opposite of a homebrewed sandbox campaign. And that's not to say that I, you know, again, I don't run them, I run a sandbox, so if they're the opposite, obviously I wouldn't. But I played in many, and I have purchased many. This was a classic 3.5 Expeditions, The Ruins of Greyhawk. I took a ton of stuff out of this back in the 3.5 days, but I never ran it. I just used these uh, for ideas. Because as I've said, these are the opposite of a homebrewed sandbox. These are created by teams of writers uh, who are doing this to creating something for a third party out there, the, the purchaser, to be able to explain everything to them, uh, to have it all pre-made, you have things like, uh, you know, goals for the players at this point. They should be, you know, have discovered this or that, where they should level up. All sorts of stuff that is predetermined. They are, to me, in variations, railroads by their very definition. Whereas the idea of a sandbox, a true sandbox, is there's no railroading. And so what happens is you need to think about creating a sandbox in a kind of counterintuitive way. Instead of thinking about you know, like, what's the minimum amount of detail that I need to create a, a, a sandbox homebrewed world that I can actually run for a group of players? But instead, what you've got to think about is, what is the maximum amount of detail that I should create that doesn't prevent the organic growth of the campaign that comes from people playing in it? Because too much detail causes railroading. Now, in fact, I really like world building and setting up, you know, continents, settlements, the personages. I, I just enjoy that. But one, you don't have to do that at all. And two, my level of what I consider, you know, uh, sufficient is very minimal in terms of what you might find in a published setting. And for this example, I'm going to go with the absolutely no details uh, example here to show you how you can literally create a uh, homebrewed sandbox on the fly. Basically, you just tell the players they're from somewhere else far away. They've all come to this continent. They don't know anyone. They don't know anything about it. They just have a letter of introduction to your first NPC. We'll say a tavern keep, you know, the old cliche. And if they ask, why did they leave? You know, just say economic hardship. The old world doesn't matter. You're on this new world. We're not going to talk about that. And I guarantee you, your players will buy into this concept initially just to see what happens. It's sort of like when you watch a movie. You know, you're going to give it 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes to see, you know, does the concept hold together? Am I interested in the characters? Uh, am I interested in the conflict? Is there something interesting going on? And the players have an even higher incentive than you just on your couch with your remote. They want to play an RPG game. That's why they came. They want to continue to watch this. They want it to be good. So really the only details that you need when you're starting this no details concept is the name of the continent, the name of the settlement, right? Uh, and the tavern keep that the players meet. And this brings us to a very good point of something you do need, a tool that you need to run any kind of campaign, but especially this no details, minimal uh, setup, names. You need to either have lists of names that you've prepared or you have some means of generating them. They have all sorts of online generators uh, that you can use and have those at the ready. Now, I use a screen when I run, partly out of habit. I know a lot of people don't use them anymore. But I do it also, I like mystery. I've got documents I'm looking at, roles that I'm making that the players aren't privy to. 
So if I have a list of names, I have that among the documents that I have behind the screen. And I'll just go and use those as I start to describe things. But I'll use a generator just for a few examples here to show you can just literally do this on the fly. So when the players go to the tavern, I always use the name Zodi. I've explained this many times in other videos. So I'll just say the tavern keeps name is Zodi and the continent is Ecos. That's how you pronounce it. And the town is Mistbell. And I'll just say that it's a coastal city and Zodi's tavern is right on the docks. So the players literally get off their ship, walk, you know, 50 feet or 100 yards, whatever it is, but they, don't, they haven't had time to explore the city yet. They can if they want to, but they haven't yet. Now here is a very important note. If you are generating names on the fly, whether on the list or literally on a computer, write them down and write down what they reference to. Because I have discovered at the end of a session, I've written down a name with no reference and I will pick my brain and sometimes I can figure it out, but sometimes I just have no idea. So write it down right away. All right, so the players are just sitting in this tavern and getting to know one another, introducing their characters, however you're gonna run this first session. And the cliche is that someone comes up to them at their table and either asks for help or literally has some job they want them to do. Or they go to Zodi and he says, oh, those guys over there are new in town and they're first level people. That sounds like something for them. Now you could do that. But to me, again, that's a little railroady. I want the events of my campaign to come out of the players' activities with a little goading because I've got to give them, you know, what am I seeing, what's going on? So to use a real world example, in a game that I ran, they're at Zodi's Tavern and one of the characters was a gnome and she said she liked the finer things in life. So she ordered the most expensive ale on the menu. So I told her, you taste this and this ale is fantastic. In fact, it's the best ale you've ever had. I just threw it out there. Just a little atmosphere, a little flavor. So she went over to Zodi and said, oh my God, where is this, where'd you get this ale from? And he goes, well, there's this master dwarven brewer named Delmok. Now this is his specialty, you know, very few casks that he makes, but you know, he's a friend of mine from the old days back in the wars, just making this up. And he, you know, he makes it for me. And then he adds, you know, I've been thinking about selling this to other towns. In fact, I know of a town where this would be a huge hit. It's a day's journey away and it's called Ocean Wall. But the problem is there's a huge tariff on any kind of ale going to another city to protect the lower local brewers guilds so it wouldn't be profitable and then i just let that sit he's got a customer and he goes on just to see what what she does so she goes back to the players and they're talking you know again they're at the table and they sense that there might be an opportunity here they sense this is something kr wants us to do because he just pointed this out he just made it up on the fly and in fact, if they just decide, we're going to start wandering around, I just do that and I have to make up stuff, you know, what's on the docks, you know, where do they go, that kind of thing. But no, they decide, let's, let's investigate this. So they go back to Zodi and they say, hey, is there a way to smuggle this ale up to Ocean Wall? And we'll do it. They're all like neutral. One person I think was catted good. These guys are all neutral, this party. And Zodi knows them. This is their contact. So I'm going to assume he's in, you know, he's got this letter of introduction. He trusts them and he knows their level and what they're capable. And he says, okay, well, in fact, you know, obviously this tariff is there. So I say they inspect carts going out or ships and ships are very expensive. It might not be worth it. So you're going to take a wagon. They're, they're going to inspect them. And then I let it sit. And the players say, well, is it possible that we could make casks of this, but create a false bottom on the top and put like wheat or rice or grain of some kind? And I say, you know, I say, yes, you know, it's possible. It's still going to be inspected, but let's try. So they spend a little of their cash to get someone really good at this. A cooper, a barrel maker. That's important. Because I've told them they're going to inspect because they want this, you know, they, they're, they're trying to prevent smuggling. So they make this, this these barrels and they have an inspection. I made up this guy's name. I'm not going to keep going with the, the online thing. You get it. But his name was Zelmer and he was this officious inspector guy really obnoxious abusing people and whatever I just made him up so the players would dislike him. he's like an IRS agent right and he inspected it but they passed but he was suspicious he just didn't like the way they looked right <laughs> and I write down Zelmer officious you know inspector because I thought what kind of inspector would be humorous so they go up north, they go through the city, they run into these bandits, they have their first battle as a group, and the bandits are connected. They realize they have these signet rings that are connected to something. I just made this up. I didn't even know what the rings were. I just put spider rings on them. Again, I've been doing this a long time, right? But the point is, 
you know, I'm always trying to think of things that I don't really know what they are. I'm just making them up. Let's see. So they go up to the town and they go up there and they deliver the casks. And <laughs> I threw in, when they went into this, the main guy has this big gambling palace. When they went into his office to see him, this guy was leaving. And he was all wearing black and a black hat. And I patterned him after the creepy guy in Poltergeist 2, if you remember that. And he just looks at them and, and just tips his hat and he walks out. So, of course, the players are thinking, about it, who's that? Okay. So I said, oh, he's this guy, Professor Inth. And, you know, uh, again, if they hadn't asked anything, I wouldn't have done it. I just had to have. But, of course, they, they're curious. Who's that? He's Professor Inth, again, random name. And he wants to get a ride back, in fact, to, to town, back to your town. So you got an empty car, you might want to give him a ride, you know, charge him a fee. Well, they're very suspicious, the players. They're thinking, he's setting us up for something. And if they don't give him a ride, they don't give him a ride. I just threw it out there. I have no idea who this guy is. Just made it up. So they said, okay, we'll take him. But we're going to charge him like 10 gold, right? And so he counted out his gold. And when they saw him, his skin was so pale, it almost looked like he had makeup on, he had his hat. And he stayed under the cart like the sun bothered him. So of course they're going, is it a vampire? So they had no idea. And then the campaign is rolling, right? They, they did meet some of these criminals in this town with the spider gang. They took Professor Inth back, they met his contact, and away we go. Because here's the thing, this is where your work begins with this kind of no details campaign. After the session, all the things you've created, the people, the places, whatever, you need to flesh them out. You need to say, this is what this person's a little bit of their background. You know, a paragraph is all you need. But you got to do it. You can't just have a list of names, places with no details. Because you're going to forget who they are, what their relationships are with other NPCs. And the players will begin to realize that. And just like a movie... 10 minutes, 20 minutes in, and you're realizing as a viewer, none of this is hanging together. It doesn't make any sense. Or worse yet, it's uninteresting. You're going to change the channel. And the thing is, what you'll realize is, when you start to flesh out these characters that you created on the fly, they actually existed in your world. You ran them. They, you just chose to see the, the, the guard is officious and pompous. Zodi is this, you know, you know robust... Uh, tavern guy, very charismatic, etc. Et Inth is mysterious. And as you're fleshing it out, it'll give you ideas about storylines, and you know, relationships, rivalries, feuds, alliances, anything else in your world based on what happened when the players were running into these things. You're not just sitting there trying to think all this up, you know, out of the blue. Now, you don't have to go crazy with this. Like I said, a paragraph, a little bit here, a little bit there. But you do have to put some work in if you're going to homebrew a campaign, it doesn't just happen and it can't just all be on the fly. And the best part of this low detail or my example, no detail approach is that after, you know, a year or two or however long you run eighth or 10th level, you've created this. You've created your own campaign module. And the thing is, it wasn't created by a bunch of writers who all got together and tried to make something for the broadest possible demographic. It was created by you and your players. And that, my friends, is the satisfaction of running a homebrewed sandbox campaign. The world is totally unique, and it only unfolded one time. And the best part is you don't have to be some writer of epic fantasy novels or a designer that knows every single rule and understands the, you know, game design concepts. You can do it. That's why I do this channel. That's why I'm doing it right now and I can barely speak. So please subscribe, leave some comments. I am going to go and rest my voice. And all of you out there, go and play an RPG game, whichever one you choose, and tell somebody else about it.